In 1876, on these barren Montana hilltops, one of the most decisive battles of the Indian Wars was fought, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This filming was planned to record a recent archaeological excavation of artifacts. What actually happened was one of the most exciting battlefield discoveries in the last three decades. The discovery of Custer's last trooper. In 1876, it was an age of steam and steel. Millions of new immigrants fought to escape the slums and squalor of the overcrowded cities, and there was only one direction open to them, due west. Alexander Graham Bell patents the telephone. Mark Twain publishes his novel, Tom Sawyer. Eight professional teams band together to form the National League. Ulysses S. Grant is in his second term as president. The population of New York reaches one million. And the Brooklyn Bridge is being built. Tens of thousands, including General Custer, visit the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. And outside the park, the hand and torch of the Statue of Liberty, soon to be erected in New York Harbor. The new hit song is I'll Take You Home Again, Kathleen. And the more raucous crowd is dancing to the very risque story of Frankie and Johnny. It was indeed a year to celebrate. On Sunday, June 25th, George Armstrong Custer and his 7th Regiment begin their ride into legend. The long ride to glory and the grave. A map of the Valley of the Little Bighorn, Montana, 1876. Here the Plains Indians will win their greatest victory, a victory that will only hasten their ultimate demise as a free people. History Hollywood style has instilled the image of a glamorous cavalry charge, sabers waving. There were no sabers at the Little Big One. Custer did not lead a charge, and the battle did not begin or end like this. This is the hill where Custer died, in perhaps the best known and least understood battle in American history. Hero, glory hunter, Martyr? Fool? Perhaps now, for the very first time, you'll examine the facts and then form an opinion. Just four miles away, as Custer and his men died, more than half of his troops, under the command of Major Marcus Reno and Captain Frederick Benteen, stayed on this bend of the Little Bighorn on this very hill. And this is where our mystery begins as a team of archaeologists search for battle relics hidden by the survivors in 1876. Doug McChristian, Chief Historian, Custer Battlefield, explains. Their job was to police up the siege area and to dispose of any of the equipment that uh, might be made useful uh, to the Indians. This would have included saddles, uh, canteens, uh, some uh, firearms that had been put out of action during the fight by uh, being struck by bullets, uh, camp equipage, uh, pack saddles, and so forth. Across the Little Bighorn River atop the ravine just opposite McChristian, the search for that very equipment is underway. The team is headed by Dr. Douglas D. Scott, chief of the Rocky Mountain Research Division, National Park Service. The uh, Reno Benteen equipment disposal site, or as we call it, the dump, was uh, first found in 1985 during our archaeological investigations uh, at that uh, site. We were doing an inventory, just trying to find out what resources are really present and using metal detectors to locate those. And we found a very dense concentration of metal at, the, uh, at this site. Uh, and with a minimal amount of testing determined very quickly that it probably represented the long sought equipment disposal site. Materials that were coming out included saddle parts and cinch rings and uh, odds and ends of nails that all had evidence burning. What we have done is uh, reestablish a metric grid and we laid out a grid over the site that 
creates a control for us to dig in. And then that, uh, we dig in levels. Uh, and what we do is use hand trowels, like Mason's trowels, and scrape down slowly uh, about two inches at a time, or five centimeters. And they each, each, we try to leave everything we find in place so that we can determine if there's a pattern to the disposal. The difficult work is performed by teams of volunteers from across the country, and the effort is tedious and exacting. Got two of them. Oh, that's your sleeve. Ah, okay. And then he's still in there. Yeah, he's toward right the back. Ah, uh, sign there, CD. Didn't get him. There he is. Right there. Signs of buried metal are detected over a wide area, and a red pin flag marks each find. Bits of saddle harness begin to appear. Rivets, staples, nails and then suddenly with the unpredictability of montana weather a freezing wind forces a halt to the dig and even this native hawk is powerless week two of the excavation proves as frustrating as the first still only small bits and items are uncovered each digger silently hopes that today is the day Tension mounts since their area is very confined. Archaeologist Melissa Connor explains. We're digging about 20% of the site and we're taking a very biased sample, biased towards the concentrated areas. We're doing that so that we're preserving part of the site. Archaeology is a very destructive science. When you dig something, you destroy it. You take all the artifacts out of the ground. You destroy the information that's there. So. It's pretty standard in archaeology to try to leave a part of the site there. Hopefully future techniques will come along that are better than the ones we have today. Other techniques may be developed for getting more information out of the same data. For example, sites that were dug before radiocarbon dates where people didn't save part of the site, they had no idea you'd be able to get a date out of that dumb old carbon someday. And these days you can. The volunteer crews are replaced each week, and each group hopes to be on station for the anticipated big find. Rivets and nails are historically important to the archaeologists, but not exciting for the volunteers. So once again, they begin the slow trek to the top of the bluffs. Another day. Each is quiet in his disappointment. Each one has given up time, money, vacation to dig here and all were drawn here by their interest in the Custer legend. To define that interest, we turn back the clock. The year is 1876, on this very spot of land. Battle sequences are included only as background for the archaeological search. No attempt has been made to totally detail the battle, nor the political decisions that provoked it. Here's how it began. The arguments on either side are many, but right or wrong, in an attempt to bring peace to the rapidly expanding frontier, the government decreed that all Indian tribes not on reservations by January 31st, 1876, would be deemed hostile and treated accordingly by the military. Few Indians ever received the message, and those that did tended to ignore it, like Sitting Bull, spiritual leader of the Sioux. I will not be hiding. You will know where to find me. Then as now, political expediency sets the policy and the military is assigned to correct any errors. The summer offensive to round up the hostiles believed to be somewhere near the valley of the Little Bighorn. Colonel John Gibbon to march east from Fort Ellis, Montana. General George Crook moving north from Fort Fetterman in Wyoming. And General Alfred H. Terry heads his Dakota column west from Fort Abraham Lincoln. In Terry's command, Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custer and the 7th Cavalry. His wife Libby joins the column for the first day and then returns to the fort. Later, she recalls that moment. With my husband's departure, my last happy days in garrison were ended as a premonition of disaster that I had never known before weighed me down. I could not shake off the bale flu influence of depressing thoughts. The presentiment and suspense such as I had never known made me selfish and I shut into my heart the most uncontrollable anxiety and could lighten no one else's burden. Custer receives his orders from Terry. The column of Colonel Gibbon is now in motion for the mouth of the Big Horn. It's hoped that the Indians, if upon the Little Horn, may be so nearly enclosed by the two columns 
that their escape will be impossible. George Armstrong Custer, a name that even now can cause controversy. His images are as varied as the names he answered to, and some he didn't. His family called him Otty, his own babyhood attempt at pronouncing his middle name. His men had a couple of names, Old Curly and Hardass. One can tell the political climate by the way Custer's portrayed by Hollywood. At the start of World War II, he was a superhero in the film They Died With Their Boots On. During Vietnam, when patriotism was not as clearly defined, he was played as a raving maniac in the anti-war film Little Big Man. In 1857, Custer leaves his home in Monroe, Michigan to become a cadet at West Point. He later wrote of that experience. My career as a cadet had but little to commend it to the study of those who came after me, unless as an example to be carefully avoided. At graduation, the loudest cheers are usually reserved for the lowest ranking cadet. In June 1861, that accolade went to Cadet Custer, 34th in a class of 34, with one of the worst disciplinary records in West Point history. But the nation was at war. Second Lieutenant Custer reports for assignment, now with mutton chop sideburns to hide his youth. The months pass. The Union is in danger. The Confederate cavalry outrides, outmaneuvers, and generally outfights the Union with regularity. They can't seem to cope with the rebels' guerrilla-style tactics. It's too irregular. Not by the book. Not by the book? Enter Lieutenant Custer. Soon throughout the battles in Pennsylvania and Virginia, official reports and newspapers are filled with stories about this new cavalryman, charging always at the head of his troops, a target with his long blonde hair and flamboyant style, Custer becomes a national hero. He earns temporary brevet promotions for gallantry. June 1863, two years after his somewhat inauspicious graduation, George Custer is a brigadier general. He's 23 years old. Now he's no longer an unacceptable candidate for the hand of the daughter of prominent Judge Bacon. Custer rushes back to Monroe to claim Elizabeth Bacon, Libby, as his bride. Spring, 1865. Another star for gallantry. Brevet Major General Custer. At the head of his troops, Custer receives the first white flag of surrender from the Confederates. And when Lee signs the surrender, only a handful of officers are present. Among them, Custer. General Philip Sheridan pays the owner $20 for the table used for the signing and sends it with a note to Libby. It says in part, there's scarcely an individual in our service who has contributed more to bring about this desirable result than your gallant husband. The war is over. Temporary ranks are discontinued. Custer is now a lieutenant colonel and ordered to Fort Riley, Kansas. The mission, to protect the settlers from marauding Indians. 1873, he and the 7th Cavalry are now stationed at Fort Lincoln, Dakota Territory. 1876, our story continues. Custer and the 7th detach from Terry's column and head south, guided by Crow and Arikara scouts. Indians helping whites against other Indians. Why? Mardell Plainfeather, Crow Tribe, National Park Service. You're looking at Crow country. Crow country is in good country. The Great Spirit put it in exactly the right place. It has been Crow land for 300 years, maybe. We were surrounded by other tribal people who coveted this country because they were being crowded by the Europeans who were also coming into this country. So it was people crowding people. The Crow people did not fight the Sioux or the Cheyenne because they hated them. They did not side with the white man because they loved him. They fought because they wanted to keep this beautiful country as their own. Misled by false reports from Indian agents whose monthly allotments were dependent upon the number of Indians still on reservations, the army expects to find only a few hundred here. In reality, the tribes have joined for one big fight. Hunkpapa, Blackfoot, Miniconju, Oglala, Saint Zark, Brule, Cheyenne. The largest gathering in Plains history, over 2,000 well armed warriors. It's Sunday, June 25th. Custer plans to attack on the 26th, but his scouts report that he's been spotted and the Indians are running away. He makes a quick decision he can't wait. He must attack at once to prevent any escape. Private John Berkman. I said, General Custer, pairs like ought to be going long. 
He leaped in the saddle and leaned over and put his hand for a minute on my shoulder and he kind of smiled at me. You know, John, he says, you're tired. Your place is with the pack train. You know them's the last words you ever spoke to me? Captain Benteen is sent with three companies on a wide scout in order to pitch into whatever he finds. Major Marcus Reno is ordered to cross the Little Bighorn and attack the village with his three companies. Hidden by the high bluffs, Custer and five companies head north to strike from a third direction. The pack train under escort trails in the rear, led by Lieutenant Thomas McDougall. Reno's command forms a mounted skirmish line, the Indian scouts on his left wing. He signals the charge. Down the valley they gallop, then suddenly, from a hidden draw, scores of mounted warriors emerge. Two troopers' horses bolt with fright straight into the Indian line. They're swallowed up and never seen again. Lieutenant Charles Varnum commanding the Indian scouts. We went on down possibly two miles, and the line halted and dismounted. The Indian scouts were gone, and I don't know where. At the dismount, Reno loses 25% of his fighting force, since every fourth man is detailed to hold the horses of the others. With the scouts gone, the Indians turn the left side of the line. Reno orders his men back to a defensive position in the woods. The warriors press the attack. Custer's favorite scout, Bloody Knife, stands next to Reno. A shot rings out, killing the scout. Reno is splattered. Reno loses control and, panicked, orders his men back across the river. He calls it a cavalry charge. Other officers call it a rout. Some men don't even hear the order and are left behind along with the dead and wounded. Reno sets no rear guard, no flankers. It's every man for himself. The warriors follow the troopers to the river, shooting, clubbing them from their horses. Only 90 men will make it to the top of the bluff. Among the first, Major Reno. Lieutenant Benny Hodson, a regimental favorite, is shot from his horse. A trooper puts his hand through a stirrup and drags him across the river. Hodson is shot again and dies. Today, a lonely marker commemorates the spot. Minutes before from the bluffs, Custer watches Reno begin his attack. He leads his five companies north at a gallop and then cresting a ridge, he sees for the first time the size of the encampment. Custer now realizes that the intelligence reports were faulty. Captain Tom Custer sends Sergeant Daniel Knipe to tell McDougal to hurry with the ammunition packs. A short time later, another courier is summoned. A 25-year-old Italian immigrant, Giovanni Martini, gets the call. The general said to me, orderly, I want you to take a message to Colonel Bentin. Tell him to hurry. Bring the ammunition pack. The adjutant said, I'll give you a note. Unsure of Martini's halting English, Adjutant William Cook, a Canadian, writes the famous last note. Benteen, come on, big village, be quick, bring packs, W.W. Cook. P.S. Bring packs. Martini will be the last survivor to see Custer alive. He spurs his horse along the back trail and finds Benteen. Benteen cuts back across the Bighorn in time to see Reno's command in retreat. Custer's note heavy in his pocket, he stays with Reno on the bluffs. First Sergeant John Ryan. After we gained the bluffs, we could look back upon the plains where the Indians were. And we could see them stripping and scalping our men and mutilating their bodies in a hideous manner. Moments later, McDougall arrives with a packed train of ammunition. None of it will reach Custer. It's probable that Benteen's halt saved Reno's battalion. There's no doubt that the halt sealed the ultimate fate of Custer and his men. Custer has been spotted. The warriors head back to meet the new threat. And from this point on, Custer's exact movements remain a mystery. Battlefield excavations and the location of artifacts suggest he sent two companies under the command of Captain George Yates and Lieutenant Algernon E. Smith on a probe down Medicine Tail Coulee. His strategy, one of several possibilities. A feint to relieve the pressure on Reno, a test of Indian strength at the ford, or perhaps to attempt an actual crossing. Custer continues northward to the point now known as Nye Cartwright Ridge, the terrain allows a view of the ford and of Yates and Smith. Suddenly, a seemingly endless horde of warriors crosses Miniconju Ford from the village, led by Chief Gall. They swarm into the gullies, all but hidden from the soldiers. Smith and Yates are driven back toward the high ground. Hundreds of fired cartridges found at Nye Cartwright Ridge may suggest that Custer laid down a covering fire at this point, some in volleys as a distress signal to hasten Benteen. Lofting their arrows from the cover of the ravines, the Indians present no targets for the troopers to shoot at. 
Custer continues north to what's now known as Last Stand Hill. Lieutenant James Calhoun's company is positioned here, perhaps as a rear guard to defend the mouth of the coulee, perhaps to protect the way in for Benteen. Captain Miles, Keough, and I company are set here on the other side of the high ridge. Custer ventures past the crest of Last Stand Hill, only to be hit hard by the vanguard led by Crazy Horse. The ravines are teeming now with Sioux and Cheyenne warriors. Custer and his men frantically scan the ridges for a sign of Benteen and his troops. The horizon remains unbroken. Benteen won't be coming. Calhoun falls, helpless under the onslaught. Keo is overrun. He and his men slaughtered. Below him, Custer watches helplessly as C and E companies die in their attempt to reach his position. F Company falls. It's too late to hope for assistance from Reno and Benteen. Custer and his tiny group shoot their horses for barricades. Approximately 40 men are now surrounded by over 2,000 screaming warriors. In minutes, it's over. Custer has made his last stand. Four other members of the Custer family perish with him. His brothers, Captain Tom Custer, his 18-year-old nephew, Harry Armstrong Reed, 27-year-old Boston Custer, who joined the expedition as a guide, and his brother-in-law, Lieutenant James Calhoun. The entire battle has lasted perhaps an hour. The victorious warriors swarm over the battleground, looting, mutilating, finishing off the wounded. Later, Wooden Leg would make this statement. I took one scalp. The dead man had a long beard growing from both sides of his face and extending several inches below his chin. I skinned one side his face and half his chin. And what of Custer? He was found stripped but not scalped, a bullet wound in the left breast and one in the left temple. Years later, Sitting Bull told this story. Long hair stood like sheaf of corn with all the ears falling around him. He killed a man when he fell. He laughed. He had fired his last shot. He rose up on his hands and tried another shot. But his pistol would not go off. I did not see it. It was told to me. But it is true. At this approximate time, with the officers' ladies gathered at the Custer House at Fort Lincoln to sing hymns to keep their spirits up, for no apparent reason, Libby Custer suddenly fainted. On Custer Hill, flushed with victory, the tribes gather up fallen weapons and ammunition and the red tide turns back toward Reno and Benteen. On Benteen Hill, the excavation continues. From bitter cold, then freezing rain, the Montana sun breaks through. The volunteers get a new burst of enthusiasm. Bringing them together was no easy task. The biggest uh, aspect of this whole business is, is collecting the applications for the volunteers and sorting through them. And when you have 250 applicants for only 36 positions, it's very difficult at best. So it was a matter of just going through and looking at the applications and selecting people uh, and finding them with the best qualified of the group. For instance, we have uh, Dr. Sterling Finn from California with us. He's a veterinarian, but an amateur historian with a specialty on the history of the uh, Bozeman Trail and the military sites along there, including the Custer Battle. Um, another gentleman is uh, Kurt Cox, who uh, has strong expertise in military equipment of the late 19th century. And he's been an incredible benefit in identifying a lot of the parts that we've been finding. Uh, another individual is Carolyn Bernowski, who is uh, with the National Archives. Um, another gentleman is Art Harris, Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, Will Houston, Billings, Montana. <laughs> Marlon Hall, Tipton, Iowa. <laughs> Barbara Omana, Seattle, Washington. Derek Batten, Stanmore, Middlesex, England. The professionals are pleased with some of the technical aspects of the excavation, but the hoped for glamour items have yet to surface. Dick Harmon of the U.S. Geological Survey is one of the directors and also an expert on firearms. A big disappointment to me. So far, only one part from a firearm. It was a screw out of the trigger guard bow on one of the carbines that the troops carried. Uh, we found a few rounds of live ammunition outside of the dump area that weren't burned. And I guess that's been it so far this first two weeks of the dig. But today, this man is about to change the entire complexion of the dig. Monty Cloberdance, a business executive from Wheaton, Illinois. The dig again halted by rain, Monty goes exploring on his own. He crosses the Little Bighorn River to the site of Reno's retreat to begin his search. 
And I was going along looking for artifacts, bullets, anything else I could find that could, would maybe tie it in with the battle. I saw the, the, the one bone that I looked like a human bone, but I saw that bone and of course I saw the skull. And then I put my hand, I kind of slipped, and my hand almost went into the, to the uh, skull's uh, uh, mouth. And by then, so then I scrambled up very quickly. I just scrambled up over the top. And I was very shaken by then, very shaken. So what I did, I came back to make sure I looked right down on top of the skull and there it was, it was definitely a human skull. And it frightened me so, or I, I, the, when I first looked at it, it scared me so much that I took my eyes away from it saying, no, that can't be a skull, that's not what I'm seeing. So I didn't, I, I put my eyes back on the clavicle and I started getting a very eerie feeling. He was upside down and grinning at me. Dr. Douglas Scott called and met the county coroner at the site to assure that the removal of the remains was permitted. At a makeshift laboratory in the field, archaeologists Melissa Connor and Pat Curtis begin the delicate task of cleaning the find. Removal of dirt and vegetation built up over 113 years since the battle, almost to the very day. This exclusive footage we're seeing was not professionally done, but it exists nowhere else. Ron Nichols, president of the Battlefield Association, was present and filmed this on his home camera. Once the meticulous job of cleaning is completed, the remains will go to the laboratories of the Midwest Archaeological Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. There, a team of experts under the guidance of a forensic pathologist will begin a detailed examination. Step one in an attempt to give an actual identity to the unknown trooper. A microscopically exact mold of the skull will be cast and utilized for further study. The actual remains will be preserved for reburial in the National Cemetery at the battlefield. Another stroke of luck. On hand for the dig is an anthropologist from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, Professor P. Willie. Okay. Actually, there are three bones that were found. Uh, there's the, the, the skull minus the jawbone. There's a left humerus, the bo bone of the upper arm, and a right clavicle or, or collarbone. So they have really three bones. The one, of course, that gets everybody's attention is the skull. And from the skull, we can tell a lot of things. Uh, the basic things we try to get are the age of the individual at the time of death, sex, race, stature, and any diseases they may have suffered from. For, for age, we can look at dental wear, how the skull's uh, sutures are closing in on themselves, uh, how the palatal sutures are, are, are closing, and from all those things, this person looks like he's probably a young or middle-aged adult. Okay, so that's age. The muscle markings on the back of the skull, uh, where the muscles attached to the mastoid process here, and the muscle markings on the back of the skull, the neck muscles where they attach, are very rugged. So it's it's uh, a male. Race is the next thing we look at. Uh, the, we can tell the basic three geographical races: uh, Africans, Europeans, and and Asians, pretty effectively. Uh, whites. Or, or Europeans we usually have kind of rat-like noses, kind of like you take our nose and you pull it out like a rat. This face on the skull that was found at the, the crossing at the Reno Benteen uh, Ford was, uh, was typical of a Caucasoid. It had a narrow, high nose and kind of projecting face. The stature, we can take the length of the, the limb bone and measure it and put it in a formula to estimate stature, how tall the person was when they were alive. And the, the statue estimations that, that Melissa did shows the person to be about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, Typical of, of people who are riding horses. They tried to keep them small to keep the, uh, the horses from pooping out on, on, the, on them. So that's, that's in keeping. Diseases. 
Uh, there are a number of diseases that are, are indicated. There's some arthritic buildup on the base of the skull, suggesting they have had uh, back problems. There's a little bit of arthritic lipping in the uh, elbow joint, suggesting perhaps he had aches and pains there. And uh, the one that's perhaps the most interesting is that the, the teeth were knocked out, probably around the time of death. There's a blow, and I believe it comes from the person's right side, in here, and it knocks out, evulses three teeth and it just breaks out the crowns, leaving the roots of the teeth still in the socket and fracturing the, the maxilla, this bone right here, kind of in an area like that. So that seems to be typical of the sorts of things you might expect in, in mutilations or, or trauma that occurred around the time of the death. A femur, a clavicle, and a skull entwined in the roots of a tree for over a hundred years. How did this lonely spot become his final resting place? Once again, Chief Historian Doug McChristian. Major Reno, with three companies, attacked down the valley of the Little Bighorn and struck the upper end of the combined Sioux and Cheyenne village. In the course of that action, he was eventually uh, pushed back into the woods and then made a, a mad dash retreat to the area where we are right now. This is commonly known as the Reno Retreat Crossing. His men uh, jumped their horses into the river in this area. Many of them were shot uh, along the way, and many more casualties occurred here at this crossing, some 40 total. They then continued on up the, uh, the bluffs. Here on the opposite side of the river, they went up the coulee and arrived on top. Forty men died near this spot. Is it possible after this long a passage in time to even hope to give an identity to this mysterious last trooper? Perhaps the answer lies in Norman, Oklahoma, in the studio of forensic sculptress Betty Pat Gatliff. On call to museums and law enforcement agencies across the country, Miss Gatliff uses her experience as a medical illustrator and artist to do facial reconstructions. Very tremendously. We taper the clay from one depth to the next and so on throughout the face, which gives us the shape of the face. And then the scalp area is pretty much uniform, but yet it tapers into the forehead area. To dimension the mouth, we need three dimensions. First of all, the vertical thickness is measured gum line to gum line on the teeth. Actually measuring the enamel of the teeth. And then the depth of the mouth is from the tissue marker table, uh, tissue marker number seven, which is the upper lip margin. And then the width is determined by lines projecting out between the canine and the first premolar. Or an easier way to say that is the mouth covers the front six teeth. The eyes are important to the success of the sculpture because the eyes must be anatomically correct. They must also have expression. The inner canthus is rather low. The lower lid is rather straight across. The upper lid is more curved. It covers more of the eyeball than the lower lid does. An ancient Indian portrait. Ms. Gatliff will repeat this same effort on the battlefield discovery. Judging from the location where he was found, it's determined that the last trooper is a member of Reno's command. While Betty Pat Gatliff applies her talents to the facial reconstruction, we continue tracing the movements of the cavalry. Dramatized quotations are actual statements by the survivors. Using the natural contours of the bluff, Benteen and Reno establish a defense perimeter. Benteen's men of H Company fortify the area above the crossing. Captain Miles Moylan's A Company and Captain Thomas Weir's D Company cover the attack from the east. G Company joins them. K Company, commanded by First Lieutenant Edward Godfrey and Captain Thomas French's M Company, protect the northern approach. B Company and Lieutenant McDougall cover the steep bluffs above the river. Lieutenant Godfrey. After lying there a few minutes, I was horrified to find myself wondering if a small sagebrush about as thick as my finger would turn a bullet. So I got up and walked along the line, cautioning the men not to waste ammunition. Private William Slaper, M Company. I used my butcher knife to cut the earth loose and threw a mound of it in front of me upon which to rest my carbine. A bullet struck the corner of this mound, throwing so much dirt in my eyes, I could scarcely see for an hour or more. 
Anxious to locate Custer and with no orders forthcoming from Reno, Captain Thomas Weir takes D Company and rides ahead to the hill that now bears his name. He can see and hear random shooting vaguely in the distance. Thirty minutes later, Reno orders the command forward. They retreat again under heavy hostile fire, Lieutenant Godfrey covering the return. Soon it was dark. All night long, they continue their frantic rebels, beating tom-toms, dancing, whooping, yelling with demoniacal screams, and discharging firearms. Private Edward Pigford. A soldier named Golden was beside me. When the fighting stopped, shortly after dark, I started to talk to him again. He didn't answer as I rattled on. And at last, when I reached out my hand and touched his head, it was covered with blood. Private Charles Windolph. Corporal George Lell was fatally wounded and dragged to the hospital. He was dying and knew it. Lift me up, boys, he said to some of the men. I want to see the boys again before I go. So they held him up in a sitting position where he could see his comrades in action. Then they laid him down and he died soon after. I will never forget Corporal Lell. The excitement and heat made our thirst almost maddening. The men were forbidden to use tobacco. They put pebbles in their mouths to excite the glands. Some made grassroots, but didn't find relief. Some tried to eat hard bread, but after chewing it a while, it blowed out of their mouths like so much flour. Dr. Porter advises that many of the wounded will die without water. Fenteen calls for volunteers to go down to the river, here at Water Carrier's Ravine. Four men volunteer as sharpshooters, while others carry canteens and kettles to the river. To these men, 19 medals of honor will be awarded. Only one man is seriously wounded. Now, Mike Madden was fond of his grog. It was necessary to amputate his leg, which was done without administering any anesthetic, but after the amputation, the surgeon gave him a good stiff drink of brandy. Madden eagerly gulped it down, and his eyes fairly danced as he smacked his lips and said, Hey, doctor, cut off me other leg. There was a high ridge on the right, and one Indian in particular I must give credit for being a good shot. While we were lying in the line, he fired a shot and killed the fourth man on my right. Soon afterward, he fired again and shot the third man. His third shot wounded the man on my right. I thought my turn was coming next. I jumped up with Captain French and some half a dozen members of my company. We put in a deadly volley, and I think we put an end to that Indian as there were men killed at that particular spot. Benteen's position was the most exposed and drew the heaviest fire. Private Windolph. I said to Jones, let's get off our coats. He didn't move. I reached down and turned him over. He was dead, shot through the heart. Every ridge and ravine around his position is teeming with hostiles. Benteen leads a counterattack from this position. The Indians scatter, and the blistering heat continues throughout the day. Late in the afternoon, the fire slackens, then stops. The hills are suddenly empty of hostiles. The exhausted troops watch unbelievingly as the Indians dismantle the camp and the tribes move slowly southward through the night. The morning sun breaks through, and below the troopers, the combined columns of Terry and Gibbon. The Battle of the Little Bighorn is over. But the Indians' greatest victory becomes the tool of their ultimate defeat, as Custer's loss shocks the nation and spurs a massive retaliation. But what of our last trooper? Can sculptress Betty Pat Gatliff even hope to approach his real appearance? For example, in 1958, this body was discovered at the battlefield, buried where he fell. Modern science and Betty Pat's technical artistry produced this result. A search of the archives to find a match based on where the body was found produced this man. Sergeant Miles O'Hara, 25 years old, from Alton, Ohio. There is little doubt the sculpture was amazingly close to the real O'Hara. At the office of the state medical examiner in Oklahoma City, she now puts the finishing touches on our last trooper. We've purposely obscured the portrait to allow the full impact of the result. Can she possibly come as close as she did with O'Hara? People age at different ages. So it, in other words, when you stop growing, you start aging. So some people look older at certain ages than other people do. So you just have to sort of hit a happy medium. And there are certain facial changes take place as you age, but nutrition has an effect, lifestyle, of course, health problems. We all age at different ages. So when we stop growing, we start aging, and the aging process can vary tremendously. So we just have to take an age that's given by the anthropologist. In this case, he said that he was in his 30s, probably mid-30s, 30 to 40 at least. So I try to think about what happens at certain ages 
with the muscling, the muscles and fatty tissue start coming forward and drooping uh, downward. Gravity has its pull. And try to build in a little bit of aging that way. We think the technique favors someone 25 to 35. So if they're younger than 25, there's some things we do to make them look younger. And if they're older than 35, of course, there are things we do to make them look older. So uh, that's, that's the only thing I can do is just try to, to think about the age and what happens at certain ages and try to predict that. Uh, the tissue marker table, or the data that we use, came from Vienna, Coleman and Buckley data that was done in Vienna in the late 19th century, 1896, I believe is the date. And they measured a number of cadavers. And of course, this fella uh, comes from that era. The tissue markers are much smaller than they are today because we have potato chips and things that we eat that make, make us have a little more fatty tissue. So um, I use uh, the old data basically uh, for that reason. If I used modern data, he would probably look a little fatter because it's the fatty tissue that it changes with the different diet. We uh, historically have uh, gained more fat, I think, from the fat in our, and sweets in our diet and so on. So the older data is more reasonable for that reason. But it's a, it's a scientific technique and a step-by-step -step technique that we use and, um, and I think it's very accurate. We're dealing with averages to a certain extent. As far as the tissue depths are concerned, of course, we are dealing with averages. But the features, based on the skull, we're not dealing with averages. We're dealing with this particular skull and what this skull would uh, predict. Well, I'm often asked, uh, when I work on a project, uh, if when I see the skull, can I visualize the face? And actually, I can't. I have to put it together step by step uh, and the, see the face emerge. I have no preconceived notion what this person looked look like. I can almost see a profile when I see the skull, but I can't see a front view. I really have no idea what he's going to look like until I put it together step by step. There's no limit to how much character you can put in a face when you don't really know. But I don't like to build in distractions either. I like to, I leave things sort of generic. <laughs> I'm a little conservative. I'm always afraid that I'll build in, like in a forensic case, I wouldn't want to build in something that would be a distraction and spoil his identification. So I try to have a reason for everything that I do. I try not to put a lot of artistic license into it, my own ideas, because I like to have a reason for everything that I build into the sculpture. Research by Dr. Doug Scott and his staff using testimony from the survivors and this map drawn just after the relief column arrived and showing body locations suggests two men as possibilities. Over a hundred years after his death, the face of Custer's last trooper. The two most likely, Sergeant Edward Botzer, born Bremerhaven, Germany, age 31, 5 feet 6 and a half inches, blue eyes, brown hair, fair complexion. Or Private William Moody, born Edinburgh, Scotland, age 35, 5 feet 8 inches, gray eyes, brown hair, ruddy complexion. Unfortunately, no photo of either man has yet been located. Perhaps in a dusty attic somewhere a matching photograph exists. Perhaps none will ever surface to prove his real identity. His destiny may be to remain the unknown trooper, representing all of the men who lie in unmarked graves across the Western Plains. His remains will join his comrades here at the battlefield. The remains of over 200 troopers lie beneath this monument on Last Stand Hill. In 1877, Custer was reburied beneath this monument at West Point. In 1933, two days before her 92nd birthday, Libby Custer joined her boy general. In 1926, Lieutenant Godfrey, now retired General Godfrey, paid tribute to the fallen on the 50th anniversary of the battle, here at Last Stand Hill. Godfrey meets White Bull, nephew of Sitting Bull. They exchange gifts.
after he's still wearing his famous mustache, places wreaths to honor his fallen comrades of the battle. A final salute from the honor squad. And then in this actual footage, perhaps seen for the very first time since 1926, another unit of the 7th Cavalry charges across the Reno retreat crossing. Scouts in the Valley fight was the last surviving officer. He died in 1936 in San Francisco at age 88. Frederick W. Benteen retired from the Army and died in Atlanta in 1898. Marcus Reno was dismissed from the service in 1880 and died in Washington, D.C. in 1889. The battlefield remains, just as it was in 1876 as a living memorial. Brave men died here on both sides. People crowding people. Perhaps that's the simple cause of all wars through history. Wars happen and men die. But legends somehow never do. So long as there remains a memory of the frontier west, there will always be a vision of that thin blue line riding somewhere. The officers and men of the 7th Regiment, United States Cavalry, to whom this is respectfully dedicated. This profile of a dying ship was America's most shocking reminder of our entry into World War II. This is the story of that proud ship and the men who sailed her, and the parallel lives of two officers, one who served aboard and loved her, and one who struck the first blow in the assault that killed her. Two men whose destinies collide in a moment in history that changed the world forever. Now begins a story of heroism and devotion to duty that you were never taught in school. It begins and ends here at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, with the dedication of this monument to a name that stirs a faint sense of recognition, a slight jarring in some remote corner of the mind. The story of a faithful band of brothers who gloried in the name given to them by the very enemies they fought, the Buffalo Soldiers. In 1876, on these barren Montana hilltops, one of the most decisive battles of the Indian Wars was fought, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This filming was planned to record a recent archaeological excavation of artifacts. What actually happened was one of the most exciting battlefield discoveries in the last three decades. The discovery of Custer's last trooper. The officers and enlisted men have cheerfully endured many hardships and privations, and in the midst of great dangers, steadfastly maintained a most gallant and zealous devotion to duty. And they may well be proud of the record made and rest assured that the hard work undergone and the accomplishment 
of such important and valuable service to their country cannot fail sooner or later to meet with due recognition and reward.